No. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam, and I'm here with Daria, and we're going to talk about some modern games from some retro genres today. Um, Daria, do you want to introduce yourself in case people don't know you already? Oh, well, I am Daria, <laughs> as already mentioned. Um, I have a YouTube channel, uh, Daria Plays RPGs on YouTube, where I play RPGs. <laughs> That's really descriptive. Um, <laughs> you can find it. And All I right. will probably, I don't know. Oh, we were going to talk about console RPGs today. I think CRPGs. CRPGs, yeah. So it's loosely related to my usual content. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there are any newer ones that are like the older console ones, too, we can talk oh. about those. Well, for anyone that's seen the Nintendo Direct, there's a lot of those <laughs> who apparently have mixed feelings about. A lot of poorly named games. <laughs> well, you don't love like a triangle strategy? Project Triangle? Or like, I don't know. No, no, it was, they renamed it. It was Project Triangle. Now it's Triangle. I don't know. Tri oh, triangle okay. Starbucks. That's the new name of it. Right. The sequel to Octopus Trousers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, and I'm Pam. I have a channel called Cannot Be Tamed on YouTube where I talk kind of about everything. I tend to cover a lot of NES, but I also, PS1, I don't stick to any particular genres. Sometimes I talk about new games. I just sort of jump all over the place wherever I want. <laughs> And uh, yeah, hello, welcome to the panel. So yeah, we're gonna talk today about some modern spiritual successors. So genres that we really enjoyed sort of like in the 90s or around those times that don't seem to get as much attention now, but they are still out there. Some of these genres have had sort of a little bit of a renaissance lately. And though most of them aren't from the like huge developers. Um, if you look to the smaller indie spaces or double A spaces, you can find a lot of um, really great stuff. So what do you want to start with? Um, we could start with, I don't know, we were talking about point and clicks earlier. We were, yes. Yeah. So point and click adventures were a huge thing and a certain point in time. And a lot of people said after, like, after Grim Fandango that adventure games died. Which... I don't think they ever died. Like, they never went away. Exactly. Um, I think, yeah. I think what people really mean was, like, Lucas Arts quit making them and Sierra quit making them, which were the two juggernauts at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but it, Dreamcatcher Adventure Company, they continued to release. I mean, Mist was huge. Like, it's like mm -hmm. Point Clicks went from the little animated characters to now we've got these uh, games that incorporate, like, quick time videos and are mm -hmm. now first person. And that was, uh, like, the genre didn't go away. It just kind of metamorphs. Yeah. Yeah, it, it uh, evolved into something else. And though, you know, there was maybe a little less of them, they were definitely always still there and now you've got all kinds of adventure games some of them are going back to that old formula i mean you've got things that are like direct sort of spiritual successors like thimbleweed park which basically takes um like a maniac mansion or a day of the tentacle template and just puts it in a newer game with slightly spiffier graphics but still uh, relying on those like older graphics even has some pixel hunting in it as sort of a joke. <laughs> um, but then there's also all kinds of other ones. The one I always think about, the developer I always think about is Wadget Eye Games, who just I think makes the best sort of modern point and click adventures that sort of stick to that older style. Um, the Blackwell series is a great one and um, Unavowed is actually one of my favorites that kind of brings to mind the Quest for Glory series because it sort of combines the adventure with the RPG and um, Glory. yeah <laughs> I was actually playing Quest for Glory for, for this morning before this is that the one in um, Africa no that one uh, that's three the one in uh, yeah four is the one in like the Eastern European kind of 
setting? I, I don't think I've played for. Uh-huh. Hmm. My favorite. They've got really good voice acting. Jennifer Hale is in it. Um, so, yeah, so those are really good. Did you have any favorite sort of new point and click adventure games or adventure games in general? Um, so most recently I have been playing, um, cause I went on kind of a, kind of a splurge of, uh, exploring like the, the switch library and I bought mm-hmm. a Trooper Brook for switch, mm-hmm. which was a Kickstarter, um, as as these all are yeah <laughs> the kind of renaissance games all seem to start off as these like hey i'm gonna i'm gonna reinvent the genre give me money um or revitalize the genre not really reinvent mm-hmm. um and i've been having a lot of fun with that it's a weird i'm trying to think of what it's it's a definitely kind of a uh I don't know if I'd say it's pixel hunting. It's not 2D. It's more of this kind of claymation style um, yeah, animation cool. in this like little Eastern European village. And, and then it incorporates a lot of like kind of B-movie sci-fi tropes. Oh. Like it's it's tell it's an interesting story. I'm having fun with where it's going. Um, it definitely doesn't take itself too seriously. Uh, case in point, there is one puzzle in particular uh, where you find a vibrator and have to <laughs> puzzle with it. <laughs> um, right. it's, got really, it's got a really eclectic cast of characters that are just really fun and animated to look at. Um, mm-hmm. so I've been enjoying that one a lot. That's cool. I just played one called The Little Acre and it's also got this really cool animation style. Like it looks like a cartoon from, I don't know, mm-hmm the forties or the fifties or something. It's like this beautiful, beautiful animation style. And it's got like, it's almost like an old Disney movie or something. It's got a, a dog character who's always like saving this little girl character, but like, she doesn't even know it. She just thinks like she's doing all this stuff herself, but there's this like very helpful dog behind her all the way. And it's kind of the same thing where it takes sort of this sort of newer, kind of mechanics of an adventure game in order to do things but it's still very much about like the puzzle solving and the story and amusing things happening i love it when um because i feel like adventure games are really uh some of the the best format for just telling stories Mm -hmm. because it's not so much on the action it's really just like involved into the characters and and and, uh the settings um but i love it when they kind of mesh it with another like either art style or just other influences because it's fun to see different tropes and genres played out in that format. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I like it when, especially like, I really like adventure games that sort of combine with horror um, in an interesting way. Um, Some of my favorites are from Harvester games. One of them is called the cat lady and it is a fairly typical point and click adventure game with a slightly odd control style, but it's just like very dark and bleak. It's got like this really cool aesthetic where at first it kind of looks like it's just doing the black and white with pops of red thing, but occasionally like it gets into and there's like these really like sickly greens and gold when things like get really get really screwed up and it's got some just great voice acting and like really cool kind of psychological character studies among all of the puzzles and things like that. And those kind of games also tend to not have super like moon logic puzzles. They tend to make sense. It's not the kind of thing that you get stuck on for forever, (laughs) which is something that could definitely happen in the older ones. Yeah, I definitely prefer um point clicks where it's not unfairly stacked against the player like things if there's a I love it when there is a a kind of symphonic logic to it like if you Mm -hmm. you pay attention and you put the pieces together you will come to the conclusion you know Mm -hmm. for sure that's probably harder to do for the developer but when you find a game that really clicks that way it's so much more satisfying yeah yeah, for Do sure. Do the controls and Harvester add anything to the horror aspect? Like you're always fumbling. Um, in like the Harvester games, like the Cat Lady. Um, 
sort of. They've, the controllers are done in a way where you actually don't even need a mouse, so you can do everything with the keyboard, which just takes a little getting used to. But there's not really any, um, like, you're you're not under any time pressure to, like, respond in a certain way or in a certain time. So it's just a matter of getting used to it. There is a little bit of a, like, um, oh, this is kind of weird and unfamiliar, and when you start the games, they're the scenarios are very weird and unfamiliar, so it kind of does a good way of reflecting that. But it's not like a Silent Hill, you suck at fighting, and that makes it scarier kind of thing. Well, I always liked um, some of my favorite like adventure horrors, like the Clock Tower series, mm. where it's like um, when Jennifer gets scared. And mm -hmm. she 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 has like that initial sprint where she can run, but then like she runs out of breath and then she's you, mm -hmm. like the controls turn to mush at that point. Yeah. <laughs> and it really adds to the tension as like she's slowly lumbering away and this guy's chasing her because now she can't breathe. And like mm -hmm. and the music like picks up and it, it it's like every part of the game really kind of like zones in on that tension and fear factor, which is brilliant game design. Especially yeah. For, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what else was I going to talk about? Oh, um, other sort of just like horror adventure games. Um, the Medium, which just came out very recently, I think in the last couple of weeks, it's by Bloober Team. And they have made a few that I would consider like horror adventure games. Like they're not super action-y. They're not like super into the survival. It's more about like going around and exploring a creepy place and discovering the story and about the characters and stuff, which really fits into that adventure game thing. And I thought it was really well done the way they had like your, the real world and the spirit real world. And sometimes you were seeing both of them at once, which was really cool. Um, but I often find that in adventure games, they, they feel the need to put in like a way to die or like a fail state when I don't always yeah. think it's needed. No, I don't think fail states are necessarily scary. Um, the game, I guess they're trying to, like, the game should have stakes, but that doesn't mm -hmm. mean, like, a, I don't know, a fail state isn't stakes to me, that's just, it, it's a waste of time. Like, it, yeah. either it's meaningless and you go right back to the point you died, at which point now it has no effect, whatever, or you mm -hmm. go back to a save point where you've just wasted all this progress. It just frustrates the player. Like, it doesn't, I don't think it actually adds anything to the experience. Yeah, that's how, that's how I felt, and that's kind of how I felt like they they put in these sort of stealthy or running away from monster sections where I'm like, mm, I didn't. This didn't make me more scared. It just made me frustrated. <laughs> it's like when I was playing. Um, good example of modern uh, horror adventure. Uh, I was playing the Call of Cthulhu, um, mm -hmm. which didn't review very well, um, but I still I felt it was. A really like I had a lot of fun with it. I don't. Mm -hmm. I love the game. I don't care what you <laughs> say. It's fun. However, it incorporates stealth sequences, um, which are terrible. Mm -hmm. They're just they're they're bad. They don't control very well. They're frustrating to do. Um, and it's the game. I don't feel like the engine was built for stealth, so it really detracts away from the adventure when suddenly you're sneaking around hallways from like insane asylum guards. Mm -hmm. And when they catch you, it just sends you back to the beginning of the, the sequence where now you just have to do the whole thing over again, no matter how far you got. Yeah. And yeah. it's it's the worst. It's the worst aspect of the game. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't like that either when I when I played through that game. But uh, it was kind of cool. I don't know. I always like to see people's takes on um on like the Lovecraft kind of stories so we and we've gotten a lot of them lately so and it's weird I feel like every time someone does Lovecraft they're they're trying to do like water punk which is what I'm mm -hmm. now calling it water like, punk. <laughs> they're always wet and dripping they're always in these places that have been like there's like barnacles and all the buildings and mm -hmm. there's floods and it's like I've played a lot of Call of Cthulhu and and watched I don't remember any of these adventures like yeah anything that's actually in the stories <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess they just need to take that because got all like the underwater stuff. So it just yeah. needs to permeate everything. Now, I'm kind of getting like way off track here, but there was also just a recent game called um, Call of the Sea, 
which is a it's like a sort of walking sim um, narrative exploration game. And you find out fairly soon into the game that it's actually Lovecraft based. Like it's it's kind of a Cthulhu game, but you're on like this beautiful. <laughs> you're on, yeah, you're on this like beautiful like Tahitian island and everything is bright and sunny and it's just got these beautiful colors. And though you do, you know, occasionally go into, you know, darker uh, environments that seem to fit more. It was really nice that it was kind of like a positive spin on it. Like it wasn't like, oh, you're you're slowly losing your mind. It was like you're actually kind of discovering yourself, which was I thought was a really cool take because so many of them are are, are quite similar. <laughs> well, I feel like the, the point of Lovecraft was always like, what if, oh, besides racism. Besides racism, um, yeah. Besides racism, the point of Lovecraft was, what if there was horror lurking in the everyday world? Mm -hmm. Just below the surface. So then when you take the environment and you're like, oh no, it's underwater and it's creepy and everything's yeah. wet. And it's like, well, that's not really everyday life. That's not a hidden horror. That's right in front of my face. And now it's water apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Like that's I I love the visual of it. it. They're fun to play. Like Sinking City is a uh, janky and messed up, but it's, <laughs> it's a good world. Like I enjoy. Yeah, it. yeah. But, I really like Sinking City, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Um, do you have any other adventure, modern adventure games you want to talk about, or do you want to? Um. Well, again, in the kind of the walking sim and going back to games that don't have a fail state mm -hmm. um like i was saying uh offline to you earlier uh i really enjoyed uh i've been playing Oberdin a lot yes um <laughs> which to me it's in one way it's it's it, it's not like other old point and clicks but it's definitely has that adventure game uh like you're you're exploring this world a very small world you're on one ship like this mm -hmm. and you keep discovering like you go you're going backwards chronologically and you start at like oh well there was a murder okay mm -hmm. how did it happen and it shows you these scenes and who was involved and you have you have a crew roster of 60 people and you got to figure out it's basically clue how they died yeah who did it, and <laughs> where it happened <laughs> mm -hmm. only it's clue with instead of trying to figure out three things you got to figure out you know 60. yeah which I love. And then it's like, as you go farther and further into the story and more of these events unlock and you realize like, oh, this is a horror game. Like mm -hmm. terrible things have happened. And yes. it manages to be creepy and scary without really putting any stress on the player. Like nothing's going to happen to you as the investigator, but the mm -hmm. things that are happening to these people were so horrific. And I feel yes. that was a very successful way of, of presenting, uh, that atmosphere without punishing the player. Yeah, for sure. That was that's a really good point about that game. And I just I don't know, Return of the Ober Din manages to like both be completely unique while at the same time sort of take the best from so many other games. Like taking super um old kind of graphic style, but like mm -hmm. making it look really good. <laughs> like you couldn't have made this game in, you know, on some of those older systems, but it's basically just picking like, <laughs> like one bit graphics and, and making it look really nice. And so it's sort of adventure gamey, but it's also like, it's not hand holding. It's not really telling you where to go oh, or what to do. Anything. It's just no. like, here, figure it out. It's like, mm -hmm. Oh, this is what I'm doing. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I think. And I, it just had all sorts of cool twists. Like, it's not, you're not a detective, you're an insurance adjuster. Like, it just. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was great. I think that was my game of the year in 2017, 18, whatever, whenever it was. <laughs> I don't remember when it came out on PC, but like Marvel Mills here, who just got his copy in the mail, I got the limited run. Mm. Which just came out. Nice. Like people are obviously just receiving them. Um, so I've been cracked out on that for the last week. I had a friend for the last year that's been like, you need to play this. You would love this. You would love this game. This is your mm -hmm. game. I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> <laughs> <He was right. laughs> yes. 
Yeah, I I played through it once. I I actually started to try to play it again because my memory sucks. So it's not like I'm gonna no remember that's, all that's the answers. The <laughs> yeah, that's the best when it's like, oh, I have a bad memory. Oh, I get to enjoy my game again. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that doesn't work out so well is if I take a break, like if I don't play it for a week and I come back to it, I'm like, oh, just have to start again, I guess. Um, I've abandoned so many RPGs because I've done that and I load up the save. It's like, I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Games need to like have a thing where like, oh, I see you haven't logged on for three weeks. Here's a story summary and here's the buttons you have to push. Oh, oh speaking of, modern uh returns to old genres dragon quest 11 mm -hmm. implements that that is the new feature that they have added is, is oh is it up the game it gives you a synopsis of what happened in the story nice and where you're going which That's... is revolutionary like why don't all rpgs have this this is this is what they have needed to do all along mm -hmm. that's a fantastic idea yeah more should more RPGs should definitely do that. Like even playing through the Tweakin games recently and I would leave and I would come back and I'm like, I have no idea where I'm going. And then I just have to like wander around getting into random battles until I found the correct place to go. So yeah, that would be really nice. One good hack, which comes from content creation is when you've been recording your, your play, mm -hmm. at least you can go back and be like, mm, okay, where was I in the video? That's true. That's a good yeah, idea. They probably aren't recording, you know, all of their. their no. <laughs> yeah, your your hard drive's only so big. So I uh, actually, when I was playing Quest for Glory Four, um, I I've started when I leave the game for the night. I make my save like go see Baba Yaga next. So I remember. That's, smart. That's yeah. much better than A F G C A. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Um, so we can move on to another genre now. I just want to say to anyone in the chat, if you have any questions, genres or recommendations you're looking for, or just questions about the games we're talking about, just feel free to uh, ask them. You want to do FMV next? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've always. That shouldn't exist. Yes. I've always been such a fan of FMV, even though it often didn't work very well. Um, like I love my oh, Sega CD and they those games. Terrible. <laughs> they were they were not good. Even even if like there's like they're interesting sort of relics to see. Like all of those like night traps and um, there we go, blanking Ground Zero Texas or whatever. Like you either have. Um, your gameplay and your story battling each other where it's like, well, if you want to win the game, you have to just be doing one thing. But if you want to see the story, then bad things will happen. So I feel like they were very much like the video version of Two Year and Adventure where there's really only one path to take. Correct to path. Yeah. To completion. Other than that, it's just branches off into death. Like, oh, yes. you chose poorly, you die. Yeah. Like, oh, you chose poorly, you die three moves later. Like, there's mm. no, it's not really, it's an illusion of choice, which really all games are guilty of, but FMVs really distill it down to the most ridiculous yeah. premise. For sure. Yeah. All of those, like, Wirehead and the firefighting one whose name is escaping me right now, or um, here, oh my God. This is why I need to write things down. But yeah, so many of the FMV, it's just like you get to a point, you pick a path and one path leads to death and one path doesn't. And you're basically just memorizing. Perfect example. Huh? That's the, that's Dragon yeah. Zero. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's that was the problem. I, I found that uh, they did eventually start using FMV better, um, like. I don't particularly like this game, but Phantasmagoria or like uh, Gabriel Knight 2, where they just have real actors, but then they just sort of, it's basically a point and click adventure game yeah. just with real actors in it. Um, like the Tex Murphy ones are my favorite. I like the best. Oh, mm -hmm. I tried to play the new Tex Murphy, but it made me so, the I suffer from such bad motion sickness. I couldn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't get out of his apartment. Like, 
this game is just migraine going to throw up. Right. Yeah, that sucks. It Cause... did. Cause I was, I'm having the same problem with Oberdin, but I'm suffering through it because I like it so much. Yeah. Oh, Rise of the Dragon's amazing. I love that game. I started that. I haven't I haven't gotten too far into it. And I do think Prize Fighter is really cool. It's a little I was actually just talking about this on um on the Drunk Friend podcast the other day. It hasn't come out yet, but spoiler, it will next week. Um <laughs> and uh yeah, Prize Fighter is really cool because it's like almost like a punch out, except it's real people and you're just blocking or dodging or throwing punches. Uh that was really interesting. So Yes, and also I have written down to talk about dungeon crawlers later, after we're done FMVs. <laughs> um, uh, so what was I going to say? Oh yeah, so FMVs are like having a big boom right now. Although I guess it depends what kind of games you're into, <laughs> if you even know that they exist. But some of my favorites have been from Diavecki Studios, who've made this whole. Um, world of interconnected games. Um, one of my favorites is the Infectious Madness of Dr. Decker, where you're playing a psychiatrist, psychologist, and all of these people are coming in to talk to you. And you, if you're playing on PC, which is where I recommend playing this, you're typing out questions to them. And when they say something, then you like, will bring up that. And you're you're kind of solving this mystery. And I'm pretty sure the end can change, like the, the whodunit part can change. So you can play it a few times. But that was a really cool one with just like really good acting and really interesting mechanics. They're, they also did the shape-shifting detective where you're a detective who can shape-shift into other people in the town in order to get new information from people, which is really cool. Uh, Dark Nights with Poe and Monroe are two people who do a radio call-in show and get into all sort of, sorts of like supernatural type mysteries together. Oh, they sound awesome. I had mm -hmm. never heard of any of these games before, but this sounds yeah. like my sort of uh, jam. Yes. Uh, yeah, they're definitely good. What were you playing? There was one. I, yeah, the, the, the most recent one that I played was uh, Contradiction, which came out mm -hmm. a few years ago, um, but I'd never beaten it, so I went back and played it again and finally got to the ending mm -hmm. which wasn't as satisfying as i had hoped it would be <laughs> yeah the, the journey to that point was so good that i'll forgive it a terrible ending um right and i i wouldn't call the acting necessarily good but it is cheesy in a way that is very charming um mm -hmm. and enjoyable yeah uh, i think but in, so I was going to say, I'm pretty sure the detective from Contradiction is the shape-shifting detective. I'm pretty sure it's the same actor. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> that you're, you're selling it to me now. Even more, more so. Like, I was still into it, but now I'm even more into it. Um, yeah, so the point of Contradiction is it's kind of like an FMV. Uh, I just forgot the name of the game I was going to reference. The Rockstar <laughs> game where you go around saying doubt. Oh, L.A. Noir. Yeah, it's kind of like a kind of like an L.A. Noir without all the driving, um, or the time period, mm -hmm. or the noir. Um, <laughs> but you're you're a detective in this little English town, and there's been a there's a mystery you're solving, um, and you're trying to figure out. And there's a lot of red herrings. Like there's this there's this weird creepy cult going on, and there's all these characters that are kind of like really snotty to you when you go to talk to them so it makes you suspicious uh but you have to listen to their you interview them and you listen to their testimonies and they will give you a piece of evidence and you have to use that to be like oh but you said this but you also mm -hmm. said this it's a contradiction so that's, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of the, of the game <laughs> but it, the the acting really sells it um mm -hmm. and i was surprised to find out that it um it was made by uh tim Folan who normally I had known as the composer for all those badass like uh, NES soundtracks, um, like Solstice and Fictionary and Silver Surfer. Oh. Like, it's like, oh, this, this guy who's really good with um, with synthesi synthesizers also made this like a Kickstarter point and click game. I had no idea. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay. But 
uh, Wayne Lee, love how much they ham it up in contradiction. Just chewing up the scenery. You can tell they had a lot of fun. Yeah, this looks like a, a troop of actors that just went out and, with no budget, went out and just had, like, the time of their lives. And it really shines through when you're playing the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's fairly similar. Like, I'd say the shape-shifting detective is probably the most similar to that, where you're just talking to people and, like, getting their stories. Um, like, it's not a specifically looking for contradictions, but mm-hmm. um, it's, like, you talk to one person, but then you shape-shift into someone else, and they'll tell you a different information because they're think they're talking to someone else. So right. uh, there's cool stuff like oh. that. Yeah. There's also a bunch of new FMVs that are are more of that choose your own adventure kind. Like uh-huh. um, there's one called The Bunker and one called Late Shift, which they are kind of more like interactive movies. So you watch a bunch and then it's like, do you go through this door or do you escape to the roof or whatever? So there's yeah. some of those. And those I always find like, OK, <laughs> they're not my favorite. Like I like when they use um, more interesting mechanics. What I thought was fun, which is now um, like now they're incorporating those into like Netflix. Mm. Which, yes. Uh, yeah. Like my son was doing the, the, the Minecraft story mode, which they poured to Netflix. And then he was doing like there was a Puss in Boots one. Oh. Um, and then the. Uh, the sci-fi show that's really that's oh the Black really, Mirror one yeah, yeah the Black Mirror one we we sat around and played that as a family which I thought was really like it's a it's it's it, it's an interesting format to present it that's really bringing these uh this these type of games to a much wider audience yes it was a really cool idea and I also liked that that one like that it was about video games too yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know. There's just been a lot of really good FMV games or really interesting, at least like I, her story was, I think, one of the first sort of bringing this renaissance around, which is great. And just watching videos and searching for terms based on what the videos have been on. Um, and yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just love FMV, just the whole concept of having real actors in in video games and sometimes it works great and sometimes not so much, but it's always just interesting and fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, So is it how tell me how to say (laughs) hungry Garaya Garia. I think it's, I think it's Garaya. (laughs) Garaya. Okay. She'll she'll correct us if we're wrong. All right. Oh my gosh. If I've been saying her name wrong the whole time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> bad. Um, she asked, she said she's just dipped into dungeon crawlers and curious to know any good modern games in that same vein. Um, the ones that I have to recommend are, here we go, not having things written down. Give me a second. Um, uh, I definitely really liked uh, the Grimlock games. That's, yep, okay. Yeah. You know the names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, those are on Steam. I hope they port those to something because I really, uh, I was really enjoying this. I don't remember why. I did write things down, but I remember really liking them. Yeah, they're very much, well, one of my favorite dungeon crawlers ever is Lands of Lore, the, mm. um, the first one. And the Grimlock games really remind me of that. So you're just going through this first person dungeons and not just dungeons but like nice outdoor areas as well and fighting things and there's a ton of puzzles to do to either progress forward or get um treasures and things like that um there was also one that came out last year the year before called operencia the stolen sun and it's the same kind of dungeon crawler But it has more focus on character, which I really like. Like, they're not just sort of like blank slates. They, you know, have their own ambitions and things, which I really liked. And it's also a turn-based combat, which I tend to prefer. So, yeah, Operencia was a really good one. And the Grimlock games. I think there's another one called, like, Vaporum, which is like the Grimlock games, but more of like a steampunky kind of aesthetic. Yeah, I always really like dungeon crawlers that change up the scenery. Like you get, you kind of, you just get bored going through the set. Like the early ones where it's like, okay, 
well, I mean, uh, the uh, the wizardry stuff, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, technology isn't so good that you can really display what's happening. So it's yeah, like and stuff. But um, as the genre progressed, and you end up with you know much nicer uh, environments, it it just breaks out the monotony because I mean, mostly what you're doing is just kind of running around the maze and just hacking stuff. Yeah. Um, I also feel that um, at least uh, more recently, as in within the last decade or 15 years, that the Etrurian Odyssey games kind of really kind of brought back the genre a bit. Mm -hmm. And the, the, because on the DS, where you have the two screens, the one screen devoted to auto mapping really helped a lot. Mm -hmm. And I really got into those for a while because of that. Yes. Auto mapping is. Nice. I, I remember playing Wizardry 5. Uh, a friend and I would like after school, we'd go to her house and just sit beside each other on the computer playing Wizardry and just like mapping it out on a piece of paper because that's what you had to do. <laughs> Otherwise, it would uh, be impossible to find your way around. So. Oh, I used to tax my memory. Like I'm like, OK, oh. no, I'm just going to bump around the walls. And, and you learn uh, doing that. You'll learn paths through the area. But it's so time consuming. Mm -hmm. and, um, Mapping is definitely the way to go. Yeah. But as a kid with uh, ADHD, I wasn't always going to stop and take the time to make the tool that would make my progress easier. Right. Instead, I'm just going to headbutt my way through it. So having something do it for me is a godsend. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, so Sergi had a question. Are there any good modern crossovers of sandbox and narrative games? A la Terra Enigma, Act Razor, Dark Cloud. And this is a harder one for me. I don't think of anything. Um, the f first thing I thought of was Spiritfarer, which I'm not sure is totally about like that but it's a game where you are ferrying the spirits of the dead to like their afterlife and it's like sandboxy in the way that like you can garden and craft and make things and cook but you're also like following a story both for all of the characters and as like a general narrative but there's a lot of just like go where you want do what you want make things find some sheep put them on your ship Take their wool. <laughs> like, I always hear great things about Act Razor, and I haven't played it yet. I'll need to get a copy of that. I have sadly, embarrassingly enough, have not played Terranigma. I've played the other Quintet games, um, but not really that one. Um, and when I think of Act Razor, I think of it as being kind of a genre hybrid. I'm not so sure about sandboxy because it's more city building and then mm -hmm. mind-scrolling action. Um, you know what? Actually, yes. A very good Act Razor light game that I played recently um, is uh, Kingdoms, which uh, is more kind of like if Act Razor were more instead of like platforming or tower defense, uh, but you, you're, you're on this, you're, you're a sovereign entity either a king or a queen on a horse, and you're doing the side-scrolling kind of exploration bit uh, where mm -hmm. you explore the levels and you venture out from the town. And as you do so, you uncover money. Everything in the game is, is done through money. You have to find treasure um, and you have to go back to your settlement and you have to upgrade its defenses and hire uh, people to work in the town, like um, you know guards and archers and hunters. And you build up your your forces uh but as you're going out there are these portals that open up and these people monsters come and they attack so that, that's where the tower defense comes in um but it's also a lot of just uh kind of adventure exploration to it too which is it's very um it's got a great atmosphere and it's a very relaxing game to play mm -hmm. um i don't know i loved it a lot like it was it was really fun i got uh, I got into it. My son got into it. My boyfriend got into it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I got into it. I actually bought that physical. So an indie game actually came out physical on Xbox. Oh, so, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got, I got the uh, Switch version. Mm -hmm. I I loved it. Like I played the first one, and I like I could sink 
like 30 hours into that game over over the course of a couple of days. I would just like set up my phone with like an ASMR video on my chest in bed and then I'd be playing Kingdom. <laughs> I, that's a fantastic game. It looks so pretty and it's just like, I don't know, the kind of thing I can just play a lot of. <laughs> Pikmin uh, also created a very interesting RTS action hybrid. I've only ever seen one other game attempt it, Little King Story. Any other recent games similar to that concept? Uh, you might like the uh, the Overlord games, which were pretty popular um, mm -hmm. a few years ago. I feel like that did it pretty well. It was like a demonic Pikmin. I haven't played Pikmin before. Um, there's this. How you're collecting up like your little minions and they run out and do things for you, which I think Brutal Legend also attempted that as well, uh, just not as successfully. Although if you like heavy metal and Jack Black, your mileage may vary. <laughs> um, all right. There was also a question up somewhere. Scrolling, scrolling. Someone asked if uh, Casey asked, "Will classic FMV games ever come back?" And I, I think they kind of have. Like we've got both the choose your own adventure type type of FMV games. I mean, I don't know that we've had a modern like something like a Gabriel Knight two. I don't know if we've had that come back. But, like, we've had all kinds of different FMV. Um, and now people, like, I, is it Limited Run or whoever, they're, like, re-releasing all of these Sega CD games, which is so weird to me, honestly. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that seems to be the strange. I don't know which is weirder, the re-release of the FMV games or the re-release of, like, the unpopular Super Nintendo cartridges. Yeah. Like, at least the, the FMV games are bringing to other systems. While the Super Nintendo mm -hmm. ones, you, it's like, why? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't I just buy the cheaper cartridge? Like, at least bring back something that's rare and unaffordable, but that's yeah. not way off topic. Like the Disney ones. Yeah. Um. <laughs> there are upcoming, Fam oh, the Famicom Detective games. Is that like Deja Vu, like those ones? or No, those are more, well, they're more like visual novels. Um, yeah, the, uh, the Famicom detective games were murder mystery visual novels. Um, the first game was on Famicom and the second game was on Super Famicom, but only for that, um, the satellite system. So you can only get it by downloading it. Uh, but it was, it's a fantastic story if you haven't played it. Like I'm not normally into visual novels, uh, but it was a really good, uh, murder mystery where you're examining like corpses and trying to like figure out you know oh. what happened and you're there's like a, a school setting and it had a really good atmosphere and characters and the the art animation for for that particular one was was really just well done. I believe mm -hmm. it was made by the same I'm sorry I don't know his name but the the director of Metroid. Oh, okay. Like his his pet project. Oh. I'm not familiar with those at all. Good. And, well, the, the Nintendo Direct, they're coming out with with remakes. Oh, okay. Which I don't think look anywhere near as good as the, the old one looked, but it's really cool that they're they're localizing them and bringing them to new audience because they, they are fantastic stories, and they will translate very well. Cool. Um... Question from Laura. I used to love adventure puzzle games like IQ for PS1. Were you ever into games like that? Is there any modern successor to that type of genre? So I've only I played like IQ for like five minutes. It's basically like a block game. Like blocks are coming down the screen, I think, and you need to. Is it IQ? I, yeah, you're 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 climbing over blocks and they're rolling. And which mm -hmm. in that way, it kind of doesn't that kind of it kind of reminds me of Catherine. That's what, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I was gonna say. <laughs> I think Catherine had way more of a story to it. Like IQ, I don't remember there being much of an adventure part. Mm -hmm. uh, but I only ever played the demo, so I could be wrong about that. 
Yeah, I didn't play, I didn't get too far in it, but yeah, Catherine is what I thought about. It's sort of like climbing block puzzles. I actually really hate pushing boxes in games. That's like one of my gaming pet peeves. <laughs> so it's not oh, something. <laughs> I love that it's the generic like RPG puzzle go-to. It's like when I was playing Breath of Fire 3 and it's suddenly you enter a room and it's like, oh, there's no monsters. Okay, where are the blocks? Mm -hmm. It's shoving. Yeah. This, this is my reprise in the dungeon, which I, I welcome just because it was it broke the monotony of fighting, but it definitely isn't the most engaging uh, puzzle presentation. Mm -hmm. I um I mean other I mean they're not quite the same, but other sort of modern puzzle games you might want to check out. Um here we go. No memory. Um, there's games like The Bridge, which is like a 2D puzzle game. Um, the Witness, which is very much about like learning logic and building on it to get further on. The Swapper is one of my favorite puzzle games where you're sort of like making clones of yourself in order to solve puzzles. So uh, I think there's definitely a lot of good puzzle type games there's a new one that i've only played the demo of called the pedestrian where you're like going through signs and uh yeah there's lots of really great modern puzzle games uh i think over oh, done gonna plug it again oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a puzzle game um i'm trying to think of like you know and i love puzzle games too and i'm drawing a blank mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, there's a lot of good puzzle games out there. I'll try to come up with some recommendations for later, put them on the channel or something. I'll uh, uh for homebrew games. Yeah, I'm just going to grab something because this is kind of the type of thing I would cover on my channel. I got Heroes and Demons, which is a new master system, uh, like kind of bejeweled or uh, puzzle quest sort of game. Okay. Oh, that reminds me. Um. What is it? Seven Dragons? They did on D 3DS. They had Mario versus Dragons, which was a it was like a Mario adventure game, but you're doing puzzle quest type uh, battles against monsters. And then once you beat it, it kind of goes to like the the kind of Mario map thing where you, then you go to the next stage mm -hmm. and you unlock. Uh, I think you unlock other like Mario creatures to use in like your 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 battle specials. Mm -hmm. Because when you, you know, you match the three and then it pops off, whatever, like, you ha might have a monster that if you match up, like, far, four hearts, it'll heal your party. Because it's, it's definitely okay. kind of like an RPG battle style. Hmm. I recommend that game a lot um, if you still have a 3DS kicking around. And it's really cheap, too, because it wasn't one of, like, the popular Nintendo titles. So that one got discounted. Um, there was, okay. I just can't remember names of games. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, all right. Oh, Paradise Killer is fantastic. That's a detective game, an open world detective Ooh. game, which is excellent. It was my top game of the year last year. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of time left. I did kind of want to talk about computer role-playing games, since those were one of my favorite genres um, as a teenager. And they've also, maybe in the last five years or so, have been sort of making a comeback, a lot of them from the same kind of developers that had made them originally. So some things I wanted to talk about for that were the Divinity Original Sin games, which I think are like... I love those. The best. <laughs> I, I think for me it helps because, like you, I love detective stories. Um, mm -hmm. Though I know at least in the the first one they, it presents it like, oh, someone's died. Now you have to solve. And that's like the first quest is that murder mystery, uh, which mm -hmm. for me is like my favorite part of the game. Yeah. <laughs> like I yeah. Like when you go off into the, you get your big party and it opens up into what actually is happening. But for me, that like that first adventure is, is my favorite is trying to figure out you're near interviewing mm -hmm. all the townspeople and they're giving yeah. you like snarky replies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love anytime you have to solve a mystery in, in games like that. I, uh, have you played Disco Elysium? Yeah. <gasps> yes. 
<laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, I was, I love that game. And it's got no, I, it has no fighting, which is really weird <laughs> for a computer RPG. But I love because the whole thing is investigative and you're playing this absolute maniac who's like lost his mind. And you have to like, some of your replies you can kind of give into your psychosis. Mm -hmm. um, so the dialogue's hilarious. Um, but the story just is so like interwoven and, and I fucking love it. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's, it's a fantastic game. It's, it's so good. I love that there's no combat. Like occasionally there's like combat scenarios that you can pass or fail, but I don't know. I just think that like, it's the epitome of what a role playing game should be. Like the way they do the character development is just so interesting. And even though at first it was like, Oh, you're an amnesiac. How original it just like it works so well for developing your character into what you want him to be, whether you want to really lean into that hot mess or whether you want to try to sort of reform yourself. Yeah. Is, uh, is it, he going to find redemption or is he just the drunk alcoholic that can't mm -hmm. do anything right? And it, yeah. And I love how it'll give you like a challenge, but there might be like five different approaches to the outcome. And it's all based on your choice and your roles. and it, it's just <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's fantastic um there's also been i, I mean a, a few other ones there was a new torment game which i didn't love as much as planescape torment but still manages to make like a very interesting world um and then wasteland games uh two and then three which was an improvement over two in pretty much every way and sort of took some things like had more voice acting and like close up characters when you were talking to them and things like that. And then the Shadow Run games, which it's been a few years since the last one of those, but those are fantastic. Um, I got cracked out on the Shadow Run games. Mm -hmm. um, well, one, I'm a fan, for those of you who don't know me, a fan of the pen and paper game. Um, absolutely adore the Genesis uh, version. And just to, to go in and play like this computer ones is like dream come true for me. Like those are, those are just so well done and they, they really flesh out the world and mm -hmm. like, I don't know, it's like playing Baldur's Gate, but Shadowrun. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I find they, they do the cyberpunk world just really, really well. And also just have great characters. I think Hong Kong was my favorite. I think that's the most recent one, but uh, yeah, those are good. I would love for there to be more. I would love for them to series. support those. Um, I've turned my PS4 into a the RPG machine, which is kind of <laughs> ironic. Um, but I can get, like you were saying, um, the, the Planescape Torment and the Wasteland games, and uh, even the Divinity games are all like, they're about $10 to get physical on PS4. So I keep, like that's, I'm building up my library with those. And I just, <laughs> I wish they would put the Shadowrun games on it because I think it would, it would be a good platform for it and it would really fit in with the library they play okay on console yeah i had yeah. um it was funny with um divinity original sin i had it on my big like the huge the big screen tv like the like 56 inches or something and mm -hmm. i built my computer chair up to it and i'm just like sitting in front of this big screen with just the the tiny little text in it but it's the whole world is just so immersive in front of me mm -hmm. it was like ridiculous but it was fun <laughs> Yeah, I've always had just like a, a mental block of like, no, these go on computers. <laughs> I have, so I've tried, like I tried playing Wasteland 3 on Xbox and I played it for five minutes. I was like, nope. And then I went and I downloaded it on PC. But uh, all right, so we're almost, sorry. Oh, mm -hmm. I was just going to say I'm a weirdo like that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, it's good that they can like, I know a lot of people don't play on PC, so it's good that they're made available as many places as possible, I think. Oh, no, I'm weird. I emulate my retro console games on my PC and play my PC oh. games on my PS4. Um, <laughs> it's bizarre. Yeah, it's, there's no reason for it. All right. So we is more convenient at the time, I think. Yeah. 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 Whereas I have, like, certain genres belong on certain places, but... Uh, so we've got five minutes left. I will just go through any questions that I've managed to catch. Uh, Richard asked, do you guys think there will ever be another life simulation game like Shenmue? Probably. 
mean, I wouldn't discount it. Any, mm-hmm. I mean, Shenmue's had a re- uh, revival with Shenmue 3. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, are the, like, newer GTA games not kind of like Shenmue? I mean, I guess they are more... I mean, they're, you know, you do weird stuff. With a car. Yeah. With a car and guns. With a car and guns. I mean, you play tennis, you can, like, do yoga. Not driving a forklift, but I'm, I'm probably do that, too. I don't know. <laughs> I think, really, I mean, Shenmue was kind of an adventure sandbox game. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the industry as a whole has switched over to sandbox anyway. So I think we see a lot of, I think, Shenmue innovated a lot of things that have been incorporated into games since. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, another question from Gerald. I'm big into games that are like God games, like SimCity, but there doesn't seem to be any of those anymore, or am I wrong? I mean, there's uh, City Skyline was the new like SimCity that really took off on PC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, City Skyline. Popular. Um, I tend to like the sort of slightly smaller scale. Like I like the sort of strategy builder games, but more stuff like Frostpunk where you're building a city and trying to keep people alive through that uh, kind of thing. Um, I don't know that you're necessarily a godlike character as you're, you're just kind of the leader, but um, yeah, I think city skyline is probably the best I think that's the best not SimCity that you can mm-hmm. play right now. Um, I know on mm-hmm. phones, like on, it, and no one really talks about mobile gaming much, but there's a there's a lot of SimCity clones on phones. Mm-hmm. Um, Sergi asks, late PS2, early PS3 era saw several QTE style games like God of War, Bayonetta, RE4. Do you feel they were a lazy attempt to demonstrate the capabilities of the platforms, and are there any modern versions that have done it well? I never really found QTEs to be lazy. Like, I always just found it was a kind of more cinematic way of yeah. doing it things. Like, we're gonna, normally we would have this FMV, if this, we'd have this cutscene. And mm-hmm. now instead of having a cutscene where you're you're passively watching, we're gonna try to engage the player a little bit by hit a button. Yeah. You know, with with a pass fail state. Um so it's 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 a way of kind of engaging the player with a cutscene. And it maybe isn't the most successful method of doing that. Um, but I don't think it was lazy. Yeah. Was... Yeah. I mean when I think of that, I think of the um What's his name? David Cage games. Um, yes. <laughs> Heavy Rain and um, the new one with the androids. Uh, Detroit, uh, Detroit Become Human. There you yeah. Go. And I feel like sometimes sometimes it gets to be a lot because the game is basically all quick time events. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it's really useful like i found heavy rain especially and that even used motion controls which i don't usually like but like there's a part where you like had to cut off your own finger or there's part where like you're driving down the highway the wrong way and you're like flipping your controller around and i always i found that was really effective in like making the mechanics sort of uh go with the story well but um yeah i think quick time events are can still be done well when they're used sort of Sparingly, yeah, it's like seasoning. You see, you mm-hmm. season your game a little bit with them. They they can be done. They can be incorporated correctly. Yeah, sometimes they're not. <laughs> and then Richard asked, "Why do you think these developers didn't want to continue these genres?" And I think it's about money. Even yeah. even when these games sell what I would consider well, most of the bigger companies like, well, we don't want to sell two hundred thousand copies of a game. We want to sell Two million copies. I think his game budgets have gotten more expensive. The stakes have gotten higher. Your your profit margin for success is so slim that you have to sell a ridiculous. You have to sell in the millions for the for these bigger companies. So they're going to go for the games uh, that are sure hits, mm-hmm. uh, which means products they've made before that sold well, and they will keep an eye on what indie companies are doing, and they'll look for that big indie hit and then mimic it. Because mm-hmm. those are the people who have no real finance. I mean, 
their financial stake is a lot smaller. A lot of them are passion projects. These are the people with Did we lose Daria or did we lose me? Well, your yep. screen screen frozen. I'm, I'm looking at the time going, did we get cut off? <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. I just thought a, <laughs> <laughs> okay. it cut out for a minute there. Okay, sorry, I, I missed what you said at the end there. <laughs> uh oh. Um, yeah, I was just. <laughs> oh, talking about make the games and how much they need yeah. to make. And that's why I think it, that's why they're in the indie spaces, because you can make a game that is profitable. Like, there's no reason to spend tens of millions of dollars to make a game when you can make something a little more contained and, you know, not need the most cutting edge graphics out there and be um, be successful and be profitable. Uh, but I think that's why the bigger companies don't make these games anymore. Yeah. I mean, the bigger companies just, they're going to follow trends. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they, because they, they can't risk it. There's too much money at stake for them. Right. Yeah. All right. So I think we are over our time. Yeah. Uh, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone who came. Um, hope you found some new games that you want to check out. And thanks for asking questions. And my, can you have you heard my stomach growling this whole time? <laughs> because I've been doing no, it for like ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, that's it. Check out um, Daria's channel. Daria plays RPGs. Or do you want to give your Twitter or anything? Or oh, it's just uh, at Daria plays on Twitter. I'm very active there. Um, not so active on my channel this year. Um, I'm in the process of moving to see all the boxes here. Uh, so as soon as I can get set up in my own place, uh, I will start that again. Um, but it's Daria Plays RPGs on YouTube, uh, where I review RPGs, not so much play them. Don't, don't get them <laughs> a Let's Player, because I'm not. Um, but thank you, uh, one, for having me, Pam. This was a lot of fun. Um, thank you to Uplink for having me, because this is my first convention. It's a shame it's online, but it is what it is. Uh, yeah. And everyone for coming. You guys are awesome. And your participation really helped uh, with the flow of the conversation. Um, and it was it was great. I had fun. Yes. Thank you for coming. Much more fun than doing it myself. And I was yeah. much less nervous. <laughs> yeah, I was too. They're like, uh, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just stare at a screen and talk for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. So th having this banter has is, is been a godsend. For sure. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think I will end the stream now. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>